while in Ecuador in the Peace Corps, I realized that I didn't have the intellectual software, you might say, to solve this problem. And it was a structural prob problem that was inherent in, our, in the cultural makeup of how we use consciousness. It, became, it came down to an issue of consciousness. And the fact that we were using it in a certain way and we were very thing conscious. We were material orientated. And the subject demanded a field perspective. And in looking around for where, who was thinking in terms of fields, um, I stumbled upon uh, a book that uh, pointed me to India. So my wife and I went to India into a monastery up in the Himalayas, and we lived there a year. And these people spent all their time dealing with what I would call a field issue. And the material aspect of things was uh, uh, d downplayed, so as not to downplayed in the sense that the field was more important than the object in the field. And if we're going to understand objects in the field, then we have to understand what a field is. The cardinal rule in chemistry and physics is to explain why things associate with other things to form particles, atoms, molecules is that each time a formation is made, it's able to lower the total energy needed to create that form. So there's less energy needed to create a hydrogen atom than it is to sustain a proton and an electron apart from each other. By getting together, they lower their total energy need. And that's why things build. That's why the hierarchy of form even occurs and things want to get together so they can uh, do more with less. The, the tetrahedron in here has uh, 4590 triangle faces. It's no longer symmetrical, it's an asymmetrical. And it would take two of them to become symmetrical again you know, by putting them together like this. Because asymmetry is an important factor to build into this. Have you figured out a general pattern for the number of um, loops and the symmetries or asymmetry? Is there? No, I haven't. No, I haven't gone into that particular. That's all yet to be done. Uh, this one here has got five loops, one in this, uh, five tetrahedrons, one in the center and four on the outside and that's all one loop. Next circuit, next slide. And these are more complex forms. There, there's three, uh, six, and this is a big complex. I just quit making these things because this wasn't closing. This circuitry here just kept going. And uh, but you can really see the cellular-like quality of, of something like this and how complex it can get. And that's amazing. Even in that, sh that uncompleted state, that is an amazingly rigid structure. And the way you make these structures more rigid is to put more twist. Let's go back one. The more twist I put into the connectors, the more rigid that structure becomes. Uh, okay, next. So here's a comparison of an actor and a structure, an energy form, boson, and a fermion structure form. And notice that all is involved is that the twisting, these circuits penetrate each other, whereas these do not. And if I cut that little piece there, that thing flies apart. This will not fly apart. So this, we can say, now has a rest state. OK, next. I'll just let you read it. Now, here's where we start counting, counting the circuits. And this is, this is what becomes important in accounting for 
the mass numbers of particles and their relationship to each other. So when we got to this structure here, we have 81 circuits because all of this other stuff is, in, is inside of these, inside of these. And by keeping tally of the number of units, quantum units that we put in, quantum units being our simple uh, loop, we've, we, at this point here, we've ended up with 81 so far. And that's just to get to a stable mass, to a stable structure that stand alone by itself. Next. Now we get into another realm of things, and this is the superstructure or to this table. What this is, is a, we started by making our little tetrahedron or whatever poly, polyhedra you want in the center, and we built the same thing in this example around it, and instead of plugging the inner one to itself, we plugged it to the outer one. So we get one form inside of another. And again, be, we can change the, the way it's circuited, and we'll, we will uh, change the form we get. In this, this form, what happens is the lines converge to the center. The structure becomes centripetal in the inside and centrifugal on the outside. See, there. It's not even, it was made like this, like I rubber band these together to plug them in, but when I cut it apart, it achieves its own balance and it doesn't have anything to do with the stick where it reaches stability. The sticks are only in there to show you the, the polyhedra, but uh, of course nature doesn't do it that way. It's, it does it as a, as a continuum. This and this form are the same, only this one doesn't have sticks. And I do that to help us see what's going on. Next. Uh, now, here I've taken uh, one-handedness and put, in this case, put both hands, both right and left-handed, into the same superstructure pattern to get this form. And this, this form uh, gets pretty interesting. And if you study the twist at each vortex, you start to see that at these vortexes, the energy lines are spiraling off, going out and hooking up into this larger form and then converging back again, spreading out through different points, then converging back again. <clears throat> and it becomes a very interesting model because this is the model. There's only two stable structures in the universe, the electron and the proton uh, of mass particles that have a rest state. And so what we're looking for here is, will these loops produce us those two forms? 